Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the second lecture in this year's annual Strom series of lectures. Um, these lectures are brought to us through the vision and generosity of Sam and Althea Strom. And Althea, we thank you for this gift that you've given to the Jewish Studies program here at the University of Washington. Uh, my name is Debbie Kurdeman. I teach philosophy of education here at BU. I'm also affiliated with the Jewish Studies program. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Susan Handelman, this year's um, Strom lecturer. Dr. Handelman doesn't know this, but I first became acquainted with her work when I was in graduate school. At that time, I um, bought two of her books, uh, The Slayers of Moses, The Emergence of Rabbinic Interpretation in Modern Literary Theory, and Fragments of Redemption, Jewish Thought and Literary Theory in Walter Benjamin Gershom Sholem and Emmanuel Levinas. I bought these books because I was interested to see how a scholar brings together the world of Jewish thought with the world of philosophy and literary theory. Uh, Dr. Handelman currently is a professor at Bar-Ilan University in Israel. Since these books have come out, uh, the first in 1982 and the second in 1991, she has become very interested in education, specifically in the relationship between teachers and students, rabbis and disciples. Those of you who were here on Wednesday got a taste of the way she thinks about this topic and the insights that she brings to it. I should mention that Dr. Handelman is herself an award-winning teacher, um, having won several teaching awards while she was on the faculty at the University of Maryland. Tonight's topic is entitled The Reciprocity of the Teacher-Student Relation. More than the calf wants to suckle, the cow wants to nurse. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Handelman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For the people who weren't here, I just want to do, and even for those who were here, just a teeny bit of review. What's the, what's the big significance of this topic? Teacher-student relations which aren't limited just to schools and professors, but really is the whole relation between generations. Last Wednesday, I spoke about one model, which was the model of Rebbe Eliezer, who was, as you remember if you came, the Borsud. He was the cistern. He didn't lose a drop. So he received. And he never said anything that he didn't learn from his teacher. So it was a very kind of a hierarchical transmission. He filled up. He gave out. Now, there are other models. That's very simplistic, because we saw in that story that in the end, he was alone, and he didn't have anybody to give to, and the pathos of that. But there are other models. Now, in the story of Wednesday, one of the key figures was Rabbi Akiva, as you remember, who was the one who told him he had been excommunicated and the one who came to him when he was about to pass away. Tonight is about Rabbi Akiva. Those of you who learned in Sunday school or learned Jewish studies, if I say the name Rabbi Akiva, uh, probably a lot of associations are going to come up. A lot of famous stories about Rabbi Akiva. I'll just name a few. First of all, we have the story that he didn't learn until he was 40. He was the poor shepherd, and he hated the sages. I heard, actually, in some of the wonderful receptions that have been held for me here, stories of many of the people who are from the Jewish community here who started to take classes in the Jewish studies program when they were older and how much it meant to them. He's really the great model of the person who starts very late at 40 and becomes one of the greatest scholars. He's the one who has great romantic stories attached to him. He's the one, if you remember, who he's the poor, ignorant shepherd and the daughter of the richest, one of the richest men of Jerusalem falls in love with him and gives up everything to live with him in poverty. They have this romantic relationship. He's the one who, who said, what's the great principle of Torah, the greatest principle? Love your neighbor as yourself, which is in the book of Leviticus. That's Rabbi Akiva. 
love, love. He's the one who also said about the Song of Songs, which is the great, passionate, erotic poet, love poetry of the Bible between, interpreted as the love between God and Israel. Rabbi Akib is the one who says, the Song of Songs, all of scripture is holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holy. So you, you see a pattern. There are many other examples I could bring to you about this association of, of Rabbi Akiva. And I just wanted to give you that little background to the text we're going to look at because the Talmud is a very coded document. You can't read the Talmud. You can't read it. It's not a simple narrative. It's not a book. It's constructed so you have to learn it. You have to speak it. You have to have dialogue with it. You have to have a teacher. So in a way, it's paradoxical that I'm lecturing to you about the Talmud. We're going to try to learn it together. And this story is in the tractate which deals with, with Passover. I'll just give you the background to the story of Rabbi Akiva in prison at the end of his life. Why is it in the tractate on Passover? Because the question that's being addressed here is an interesting one. You see where it starts at the top? See that? Rabbi Akiva's dictum? That's the translator filling. He said, treat your Sabbath as a weekday, but don't be dependent on people. What does that mean? On the Sabbath, you're supposed to have extra wonderful food and beautiful dress. So what if you're poor and you don't have enough money for that? Should you borrow? Should you take from charity? Because, you know, it's a mitzvah to have a beautiful Sabbath. He said, no. Don't have all the luxuries. Make it like a weekday, but don't be dependent on people. Very interesting from a man who grew up very poor, although at the end of his life, according to the stories, he was very wealthy. Now, basically, the first paragraph there is saying, what instructions did he give to his son? It cites them in full, because he taught that to his son. And I'm not going to go through them. He gave seven to his son. And the next paragraph are the ones he gave to his great student, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, when Rabbi Akiva was put in jail by the Romans for teaching Torah publicly during the horrific time of the Hadrianic persecutions after the revolt of Bar Kokhba. And at that time, hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed after that revolt. And Torah was forbidden to be teaching, taught. And he did it anyway. There's very famous midrashim about that that I have in your packet. And he was imprisoned in a very critical situation. So the preface to that story is first what he taught to his son, and then what he taught to his great student, OK? There's only one line from what he taught to his son I just want to draw your attention to before we get to that central text. Um, as you see, it says, he gave seven instructions to Rabbi Yoshua, his son. And one is, Al tadur be'ir shoroshei talmidei hachamim. Don't live in a city whose leaders are Torah scholars. So I was learning this, and I was preparing my talks. I was learning these texts with my, my study partner, Gila Rosen, who's a wonderfully learned woman who teaches Talmud and married to a wonderful rabbi, Mickey Rosen. They founded wonderful institutions in Jerusalem. So she said, ah, I want to put that on the door of my house, you know? It's very different from the Platonic model. You remember Plato wanted to have the philosopher king, so not in this model. Also, I have a little Plato for you in the packet because there's a very interesting parallel text where Plato writes about Socrates in prison when he's condemned to death after he's uh, been on trial for all his questioning. And it's a very, very different scene than Rabbi Akiva's scene. So here we have a first difference. Actually, Gila was very, lived in England for many years, and, and she had a, she used to say, people would say to her, you know, you're so learned. Why don't, don't you want to be a rabbi? You know, you're a greatly learned woman. Don't, don't you want to do that? So she used to answer, it's bad enough I'm married to one. Who would want to be one? Let's go to our text. It's just important to see the context. We talked Wednesday, what's the difference between the son-father relation and the student-teacher relation, the Rav-Talmud relation. You see where it says the Gemara cites a series of instructions Rabbi Akiva gave to his disciple? OK. Now, first, there's the dialogue. And it's a very, very dramatic scene that took place between them. And again, for those of you who are scholars, again, I'm not talking about the historical accuracy. But we're taking it as a literary text here. 
beforehand. And I'm going to read it now. Chamishat dvarim tziva Rabbi Akiva et Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai kashaya chavush bebeit ha'asurim. He gave five instructions to Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai when he was incarcerated in prison. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai also was very many famous legends about him. And Lag Omer coming up that holiday is his yard site. And he's the one who remember, if you remember, said to have been in a cave for 13 years with his son hiding from the Romans, learning, learning. So this is Rabbi Akiva and this other great student. And what, what does he say to him? Just, let's just set the scene. I don't know if you would imagine this, like it's in a dark prison cell. I don't know how Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai got in there, if it was bribed. There's some stories of, of Rabbi Akiva's servant coming and bringing him water. But here you are under the Romans. Here's a, a, a golden opportunity to be with his teacher at a very critical moment. Who knows if he'll come back? What, and think to yourself, if you had this moment, what would you ask of your teacher? What would you expect your teacher to say to you? So, and how would this scene, how would this dialogue go? What, what, what kind of intonations would this dialogue occur? Okay, let's take a look at it. What does he ask him? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said to him, Amar lo, Rabbi, lamdeni Torah. Master, teach me Torah. What does he want? And again, I'm, I'm going to go through it the way I learned it with my, my study partners, and I'm very happy in the question period if you have different ideas uh, to add to this. Does he want, what, what Torah does he want? Does he want the Torah? Teach me how to live in this, in this terrible time of terror and suffering. Teach me anything. Teach me any halacha. Teach me, I just want the relationship. I'll, any Torah, any piece. Um, teach me a great metaphysical idea. Teach me your greatest, kamocha, love your fellow as yourself is the great principle. What does he want? What would you want in such a situation? Teach me Torah, teach me. But somehow he wants the relationship, even though... That was the very thing that landed Rabbi Akiva in prison. That was forbidden. Teach me. Teach me Torah. This is life. What does Rabbi Akiva answer him? What would you answer? You're Rabbi Akiva. Your disciple comes to you. Teach me. Teach me. He says, I will not teach you. I will not teach you. He risked his life. He landed in prison for teaching. All of a sudden, he's not teaching him. Why not? I will not teach you. What has he got to lose? Now, if you were the, if you were the student, how would you persuade your teacher to teach you? So Rabbi Shimon Ben Yechai said to him, Im enata melamdeni, if you don't teach me, ani omer yochai abba, I'll tell my father, Yochai, and he'll report you to the government. You think it's a joke? Why, 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 is he, but why is he joking in such a, this is, what's the joke gonna do for him? Now, some of, the, some of the commentaries that I read said, perhaps Yochai was wealthy collaborator with the Romans or maybe a double agent. So his father seemed to have some kind of close relationship to the Romans. If, if you read it as black humor, it could be the intimacy of people who are very intimate and, and can do that, okay? Now, there's a very interesting um, int uh, commentary of Ra uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, who I mentioned last Wednesday, and not on this text specifically, but on the teacher-student relationship, a brilliant, brilliant, very personal piece where he talks about his own failures as a teacher and kind of very, I think, the most personal thing he ever wrote. It gave me a little bit of insight on this. If you, if you don't teach me, I'm going to tell my father, and he'll report. So what? He'll report them. He's already in prison. He's going to. He says there are two aspects to a teacher student relation. One is the cognitive, the intellectual, you know, the analytical, the formal. And the other one is very beautiful. And remember, J.B. Soloveitchik was the representative of the brisk tradition, the most intellectual, Lithuanian, analytical, Talmudic tradition although he had a very passionate personal side. And he wrote um, existential philosophy as well. 
He said, the second one is like two children playing. This very, very deep insight. There's another aspect of a great teacher-student relation that's like two children playing, where they're enveloped by light and warmth, and they're carried by the flow of the experience, and there's no need for adult speech and talk. And they share a rhythm of hearts that's beyond what the whole logical give and take is. And it's not a dialogue of a teacher with a student. Now, I thought, I don't know, maybe that's part, we talked about Rabbi Akiva, the intimacy. Um, in any case, it's very perplexing. The Talmud asks us more questions than we ask it. It's a very interesting line. Not what you expected. And again, it reminds us of the setting of the, of the great danger of teaching. Rebbe Akiva says to him, now, here's where I got the title for my talk. Okay? It wasn't original. When you're learning Talmud, you're very glad if you find that your insight wasn't original, it means it was true, as opposed to in the university where you have to be original. Okay, what, so now what does Rebbe Akiva say to him? And this is the essence of the talk, this line. Bini, my son, yoter mima shaha ego rotze linok, para rotza lehanik. More than the calf wants to suck, the cow wishes to suckle. In other words, I want so much to teach you, more than you want to learn, but I can't because the inference is it's very dangerous. Well, why is it dangerous? It's not dangerous for him anymore. Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai said to him, Umi besakana, halo, ha, halo egel besakana. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's in danger? You're not in danger. The calf, me, I'm the calf. I'm in danger. If I learn from you, I'm doing the thing that's, well, that's going to be dangerous. I'm willing to risk my life. Now, I want to spend most of the talk unpacking this line about the calf and the cow, the metaphor, the feminine aspect of it, what nursing is all about. But I can't just leave the, the wonderful rest of it, so just for a minute. Then Rabbi Akiva gives him the instructions. And he says, if you want to get yourself choked, hang yourself from a tall tree. <laughs> now you have to hear this in Hebrew. Amor, amarlo, im bikashta lechanek. In Hebrew, to be choked is lechanek. Lehanik is to nurse. Lehanek is to be choked. So you, you hear the, the continuation and the pun. And the interpret of what, what does it mean? There are a lot of commentary. In other words, commentary say, if you want to teach, be sure you, you are attached to or cite the sources of the great ones. But you're taking your life in your hands. Okay? It's very uh, laden, double laden. And when you teach your son, teach him with a book that's been corrected. This is the other side. What do you teach a young child? The Talmud asks, what is he talking about? A young child, if you have the mistake at the beginning, it's going to stay there forever. Well, that's really true. And then the last one, my other friend I was learning with said, don't, don't use this. It's very politically incorrect. But I said, you know, it's very interesting what he says here. Maybe it's politically incorrect, but there's a lot of brilliant psychology to it. He says, don't cook in a pot in which your friend has cooked. Now again, maybe he's speaking in coded language to Rabbi, the Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. And the Gemara says, what does he mean by that line? My theme is orality and food, as you notice, then you hear it again. So the, the, the Tamot says, Mani, what is he talking about? He's talking about a divorced woman when her husband's alive. In other words, if you, a divorced person marries and the spouse is still alive, there are four minds in the bed. In other words, you're not coming to it fresh. There are four people there. And it's very psychologically astute, I think, what he's saying. And this applies even to, now what, again, what's that doing there? We could spend the whole lecture just on that famous line. As I learned it, I think all of these seem to have to do, again, with transmission, creation, nurturing, love, love relationships. How do you keep things going? Broken marriages, reconstitution. And this is a time, again, when all the leaders are being killed, a time of great destruction. But the key I want to look at here is more than the calf wants to suck, the cow wants to suckle, okay? Which, if you were bothered by, what, by the politically incorrect one about the divorced woman while her husband's alive and the metaphor here, I think you'll be more comforted by going back to the nice feminine metaphor 
of uh, the calf and the cow. Are there any women here who, who were actually did nursing, breastfeeding of their, of their children? That went out of fashion, I guess, and then it came back. Can you think about it, or those of you who did it, or those who have seen it, who, let's just now unpack this part of it, who, who controls the relationship? The child or the mother? This is the metaphor Rabbi Kiva is saying about the teacher-student relationship. Very different from Rabbi Eliezer, remember? This is a very reciprocal, intimate, back and forth, yearning, engorgement, yearning, aching relationship on both sides that's very intense. Who controls, who initiates, who gives, who takes? It's, it's, it's much more of a back and forth than the model that we looked at on Wednesday. Also, by the way, the, it's a model for text and interpreter. What are we doing now? What are we really doing now with this text? We're doing the same thing, aren't we? We're in this kind of reciprocal back and forth, giving and taking. And if you think that I'm a little extreme in that, the Talmud has a wonderful line in the tractate Eruvin. Why were the, this is for the Talmud. Why were the words of Torah compared to a nipple? Just as with a nipple, whenever an infant fondles it, he finds milk, so it is with the words of Torah. Whenever a person ponders them, he finds relish in them. So now it's the metaphor for all learning, for learning Torah. There's a wonderful description of Moses as a nursing father in, uh, in the Bible as well. We're back to Torah of the mouth again, as you see from uh, last week. If you think about it for a minute, um, who, in, in the Kabbalah, this is also this giving and taking relationship is called mashpia and mekabel. The mekabel is the one who receives, the mashpia is the one who gives. And the dialectic, this back and forth we're talking about, is the principle of all creation there. And I'm taking it to, to another level. In Kabbalah, if you've studied a little bit, you know, God doesn't create the world by hashpa'a, by outflow first, but by withdrawal by contraction, by withholding, and then makes a place for the world, and then gives. Giving and taking, withdrawal. Th this is, the, I think, the secret of ethics, the secret of teaching, the secret of so many things. I have a wonderful teacher also in Jerusalem, Rav Daniel Epstein. First day of a class on a book called uh, Share Ora by Yosef Jikatilia, a famous Kabbalist, he said, why do we call Kabbalah, Kabbalah, or Kabbalah? I mean, in America, even Madonna is into Kabbalah now. It's another how it gets in the. Why do we call it Kabbalah, which comes from the word to receive? And I love this definition because he said it's the wisdom of how to receive. And that takes a lot of wisdom because it's harder to receive than to give, if you think about it which seems the opposite. I'm, I'm trying to understand this, the nursing, the giving, holding. When you give a gift to somebody, and they say, oh, why did you do it? I didn't really you know you didn't spend the money. They ruin it. How to receive is very, very hard. You, as the receiver, speaks about this in Kabbalah, you give a gift to the giver. That's why a person who receives charity in Jewish tradition is really giving the gift to the giver, giving a scoot to the giver. So here we're back to our, our nurse, mother, child, who's giving, who's receiving. Let's, let's think a, a little bit more about that relationship. When a child nurses, and it's, this is the metaphor for teaching, the more it draws, the breast refills. Now, Rabbi Eliezer, remember, he was the one who said, I'm, I'm the cistern. You empty the cistern and it's gone. The other metaphor was the overflowing spring. The more you draw from it, the more it, more it comes out. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who was a great Hasidic Rebbe, had a great insight into teaching and I think into this giving and receiving. He said, when you teach, you empty yourself out. Like, I have all these ideas. It took me months to put this together. Now I'm giving it over and it's emptied out. What's going to happen? He says, that makes a space for new ideas to come in. So that dialectic of empty and full, like nursing, the child, if, if the child doesn't nurse, like you said, and the, and the, and the breast is engorged, it, it's stuck. It has to empty out in order to refill. And it's a paradigm of knowledge. And it's the giving and receiving in human relationships as well. There's another thing about nursing. What happens in nursing? Where is the child, what does the child do? What does the child look at? The 
the face. Face of the mother. Now, in animals, what happens with nursing? Where does the, where does the child, where does the, uh, not the child, the, yeah, they're the underbelly. There's a very beautiful passage in the Talmud in Brachot where it says the sages remind us that it was really by the grace of God that the woman's breasts are put, as it said, b'makom bina, in the place of understanding, over the heart. Okay? So that the child, the human child, is a face-to-face -face relationship. And the teacher-student relationship has to be face-to-face. -face. Now let's look at that. That's the next part of unpacking the calf and the cow. What does it mean to be face-to-face? -face? It's a mirror relationship. Those of you who are from the university and you know and you study postmodern theory, you can think of Lacan, the mirror stage, you know, this famous postmodern text, that our identity comes to us from it being mirrored through another person. You know, you can't see your face. You can see almost every part of your body, but to see your face, you have to have a mirror. It has to be reflected. So the teacher-student relationship, if it's the calf and the cow, if it's the nursing, if it has to be face-to-face, -face, what does that mean? Let me go back to Rabbi Nachman. He has very interesting, great psychologist. And he says, know this. One who has eyes to see can see and recognize in the face of the student who his teacher was, even if the student only saw him once. Because a person's wisdom makes his face shine. I talked about that on uh, Wednesday, the shining face, remember? And his face is changed. That's in the book of Kohelet. So when the student receives the wisdom of his teacher, he receives his face. See, that's face-to-face, -face, that's like this nursing relationship, much more, what does it mean? Kabbalat panim in Hebrew means to receive, to receive the face. And that's why he says you have to look at the face of the teacher at the time you're receiving the wisdom, as it says your eyes will see your teacher. Now he says that's why it's not enough to read books. You have to see the person. Real teaching, it has to be face-to-face, -face. it has to be intimate. And then he has another uh, line where he broadens this out to like friends. And I'm going to talk more about that on Wednesday. Not just teacher-student. One has to, he says, make your face clear so each person can see his own face in his face. You see how the pronouns got ambiguous there? In other words, I look at you. You're not my teacher, but I'm seeing myself in you. I'm, I'm re being reflected back and forth, friend to friend. With, so that without rebuke or preaching, his friend will immediately repent over his deeds just from looking in his face. In other words, I get my identity from looking at you. I don't know who I am unless I see my friend's face in addition to my teacher's face. So that's part of understanding on a deeper level, I think, this calf and cow. The, what's really deep about the nursing metaphor and what, what is it telling us about teaching? And I think, you know, people say, well, this is all very nice. It's Torah. It's Jewish. Does it apply to the university? I think it does. I think it applies to any deep giving over of, of knowledge. It so happened, I was, you know, all these things come across the internet. And this came, I think this was from a Chabad website. And it had a beautiful, a beautiful passage. It said like this. It said, as a mother and a baby she holds in her arms, as a father and a child, as two in courtship or in marriage, so are we with God. One chases, the other runs away. One runs, the other chases. One initiates, the other responds. It's a, it's a duet. It's really a, a, a principle of life. One falls away, the other becomes estranged, and then the other looks and says, that's not an other. We're one and the same. And they return again to each other's arms. And that even in estrangement, there's a deep bond. So what I'm trying to do here is say, what is, what is this, the calf wishes to suck, the cow wishes to suck, all this very powerful metaphor, which is also a feminine metaphor, telling us. I mentioned on uh, Wednesday George Steiner's book, Lessons of the Masters on the teacher-student relationship. And he talks about this. This is also very dangerous, very intimate can be very much abused, the, the, the eros in the, in the sense of yearning, wanting this reciprocity. 
And he says, look, it can be very dangerous. This, now we've created this nice, ideal, beautiful, nursing mother. What could be more beautiful, more peaceful, for more intimate, more harmonious? But there are negative aspects. It, there's a kind of seduction that can occur here with this erotic charge. Mentors destroy their disciples. Anybody who's been in graduate school or graduate seminar knows this. I can see the heads shaking, right? Pupils subvert their teachers. They betray them. They outgrow them. They leave them. We saw that on, on Wednesday. Those are other models. And it happens in the Talmud, too. We, we saw some of them. And George Steiner said, a, a teacher invades, breaks open, can lay waste in order to cleanse and rebuild. And these teacher-student relations are filled with it. I don't really like those macho metaphors so much. Um, I, like, I like the nursing mother better. But he thinks that the ideal is for the, the, the student to leave the teacher, come into his own, in the end the teacher should be alone. I don't agree with that. I really don't agree with that. I think Rabbi Akiva is pointing out the ideal in a way. Joseph Schwab was a great uh, philosopher of education at the University of Chicago. And he has a wonderful essay called Eros and Education. And he says, Eros, this, this desire, this passion, like that, that nursing child, is as much the energy source in pursuing truth as it is towards anything else, pleasure, friendship, fame, power. And what the teacher has to do is locate it, locate the eros, and direct it to the correct object. Now it can get stuck like onto the teacher themselves, which is wrong. But even Schwab says it requires a face-to-face -face relationship that's with, with the teacher, interpersonal. By the way, I'm going to get to the last section of my talk. You know, when you're preparing a talk, it's like almost everything that you read somehow connects. So I, I picked up this book when I was in Chicago, Destructive Emotions. This is uh, How We Can Overcome Them, a Scientific Dialogue with the Dalai Lama by Daniel Goleman, who wrote that book, Emotional Intelligence. Very interesting. And it's about cognitive theory, and he brought all these cognitive neuroscientists and physicians to, to the Dalai Lama who's interested in Western science. Very, very interesting book. Anyway, so I'm reading this a few days ago, and what do I find a chapter about a guy named Paul Ekman, who's a professor of psychology at University of California Medical School. He's a master of the face, of face research. Now I, I have interesting biological, neurological, physiological data to share with you for a second. What he did was he identified there are 80 muscles in the face. I didn't know this which lead to how many possible combinations, what do you say, 7,000 7, uh, combinations. And he became, trained himself so that he could read faces and expressions that are unconscious and fleeting. And he trained the FBI and all these customs agents to do this, okay? To sense, because all your true emotions are seen on your face. You may think that you're, you may think that you're concealing them, but he can tell what you're concealing because the movements are so subtle and unconscious, but they're all mapped out on the face. I didn't know this. So the face is a very vulnerable, expressive... Uh, uh. Now, what he says here, and there's one more fascinating thing that he, that he points out that I didn't know about face, face-to-face -face relation, and that fixation of the child looking at the mother's face, you see even why it's more important. Quote, he said, if you intentionally make a facial expression, what happens physiologically? You change your physiology. Did you know this? By making the correct expression, you begin to have the changes in your physiology that accompany the emotion. It's not just a means of display. You, the involuntary, all the nervous systems and the brain systems, if you actually smile, the brain is driven into an activity typical of happiness and biochemical changes occur. He's done all this research on it, just as a frown does with sadness. And it's very, very interesting, I think, in terms of looking at this deeper metaphor about the face-to-face -face and the, that nursing relation and what, teaching, what happens in teaching also underneath the surface. Okay, now the last part of this talk I want to share with you a beautiful uh, use of this metaphor to talk about education by Rav Huttner. Does the name Rav Yitzhak Huttner mean anything to, to the audience? Okay. Rav Huttner was, again, one of the greatest, I think, Jewish thinkers of our century. 
A lot of his stuff isn't translated. He was born in 1906 and died in 1980. And he was educated in the great yeshivot, Slobodka in Europe. And then he was in Hebron, and then he came to America. And he studied philosophy at the University of Berlin in that time when the Lubavitcher Rebbe was there and Rav Soloveitchik was there. And he founded uh, Yeshiva Chai in Berlin. And many of his students became the great uh, heads of yeshivas. He has, was very interested in, amongst his brilliance, in teaching, and it was a great teacher. And he has a collection of letters where you see him uh, in that role, and letters to different people. He never used the word Talmud, student, to describe his students. Each one he felt was in his own category. This is a letter or a transcript of a talk he gave about 30 years ago, and he was speaking to a group of young kids, uh, preparatory kids, ages 12 or 13, in a yeshiva in Brooklyn. And what he says to them, I'll, I'll just summarize it up, and you can read it in Hebrew on your own, or, but I'm basically going to give you the main ideas. He says he really, first of all, he says he doesn't really want to talk to them in a collective setting. That he wishes he could speak to each one individually, but he has to compromise and speak to them as a group because that's a situation, which is, I identify that very much, because you really can't learn Talmud or text like in a collective situation, but sometimes you have to do it. So he goes on to tell the story of Rav Chaim of Volozhin. What is that name? Rav Chaim of Volozhin founded the great yeshiva of Volozhin in the 19th century, which became the fount of modern intellectual and great Torah scholarship, to this day, the Brisker method. And Rav Chaim, when he founded that yeshiva, he decided he was going to change, the, 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 which is the Jewish seminary for learning. He didn't want to call the students of the yeshiva Talmidei HaYeshiva, students of the yeshiva, but guess what he changed it to? After all of this discussion, what would he have wanted to change it to? B'nai Yeshiva, the children of the Yeshiva. And why did he do that? And this was the most, this was like Harvard postdoc, postdoc, only the most brilliant people who knew Talmud by heart could get in there, the elite of the elite. This was not a little, little, you know, day school. Children of the Yeshiva. Now, Rav Huttner says, thinking about why he did that, what's the relation of student and child and the teaching relationship? Rav Huttner says, there are a lot of times in the Talmud, there's a story where a great sage meets a young child or an adolescent. And in the course of the conversation, the, the, the child says something so interesting or brilliant that he says, I promise that this child will become a great teacher in Israel. And Rav Hutner says, something like that just happened to me. This is, and he's, remember, his audience is these, these young kids. He meets up with a young student and he says, now let me ask you a question. You have a teacher of secular students, and you have a teacher of Talmud and Jewish students. Tell me, is there a difference? And if there is, how would you define it? So this young boy thinks for a few minutes, and he says an astonishing thing. He says as follows. He says, well, my relation to my teacher of secular students is like somebody who receives food from the cook, right? And the cook gets the food from the outside, and gives it to them. But my relationship to my Rebbe, my teacher of Torah, is like, what would you guess? One who receives food from his mother, nurse, meneket, yeah, from his nurse, meneket. That's, remember, linok lehanek, yinikat, tinoket, why? Because the, what, is the, what does the nurse do? The nurse nourishes, says the boy, from their essence, when the, when, the, when the mother gives milk, what's the milk? That's the essence of her being. The food is digested. She's giving the very essence of her life. But the cook gets food that comes from outside, and it's just mechanical. So he said, when I heard this, I said, this is going to be a great teacher in Israel. And that's why Rev Chaim changed it from the students of the yeshiva to the children. Because he understood that teaching really is nourishing and nursing. That's very different from George Steiner's, you know, they should abandon you, they should leave you, you should be left isolated, there should be a very, very different metaphor. It's, you know what else about nursing? You can only do it one at a time. I mean, 
animals can do one, uh, several at once, is a one-on-one, -on -one direct, intimate, face-to-face -face relationship. So he said, I wish I could speak to you individually, but I can't. And there's another connection of Rav Hutner to Rebbe Akiba that I want to make for the end. These seem to be stories from 2,000 years apart in two totally different conditions. Rebbe Akiba in jail by the Romans. This was his, one of his last teachings. Rev Hutner, who died in 1980 in Brooklyn. What's the connection? Some of you may have heard this incredible story, and I want to relate it to Yom HaShoah in conclusion, because today, as most of you know, is the Memorial Day for the Holocaust. What's the connection? In 1970, Rav Hutner was visiting Israel, and his plane was hijacked on the way back to America by the PLO, and kept on the runway in Jordan for a week. I think there were three planes at that time. Does anybody remember that? It was one of the, you remember, it was a three planes, right? Yeah, he was on that plane. I didn't know, I was, you know, one of the great things about being asked here, I got to do all this research, and I always studied Rav Hutner's Pachat Yitzchak. I didn't know anything about this. And I, there's a wonderful article I found about him. And I, they were kept on the runway for a week. And all these negotiations were going on back and forth. And he, they didn't know what was going to happen to them. Now, what happened? I think commandos came and blew up the pl one of the planes, right? I, was Ehud Barak, was he involved in that? Do you remember? What? Do you remember? Sabina. Uh-huh, okay. In any case, and they were released finally. Now, here is Rav Hudner, not knowing if he's going to live or die. And there was a great, of course, turmoil in the world about this, and especially in the world of Jewish education, people knew one of the great, brilliant scholars of the generation was on that plane. Everybody is valuable, but even more so was elderly man. Now, he talked about in the darkness of captivity and when the explosions were occurring, what did he think, what did Rav Hutner think about? He went back to this time of the Romans, and we talked about Wednesday, the, the death of, the, of, the, of the, the martyrs that we read on Yom Kippur, the death of Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Yishmol and Rabbi Gamliel. And they're you know, this is Mel Gibson would have a field day because these were excruciating deaths that the Romans did to them. And he said, my spirit throbbed with the words of the sages. And it says, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel and Rabbi Yishmael were taken out on their way to execution by the Romans. And Rabbi Shimon said to Rabbi Yishmael, my teacher, my heart has left me because I do not know what I'm being killed for. So Reb Hutner thought about these sages at that time in the same situation that he was in. Was he lacking any basic knowledge if his life was about to end? Thank God they were released, but one of his major books was in manuscript about to be brought for publication, and it was left there. You know, they couldn't take anything with them. And they negotiated for a long time, and they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it back. This was the volume on Shavuot, which is actually the holiday coming. And what they did, his students went around, and from the students' notes and memories, they reconstructed the volume and published it. And it has a quite extraordinary introduction. The person who wrote the introduction, one of his great students, cited the verse from Jeremiah, those who, what you say for people who have been redeemed from captivity, uh, I was just looking at it before it came. Bevechi yavo'u, in weeping they shall come, uvetachnunim ovilam, and with supplication I will, I will bring them back. And he writes in the introduction, I, they will come with weeping and I will bring them with supplication, found their fulfillment in this volume and in this story. And I'm thinking of Yom HaShoah. I'm thinking of this as part of today. And he writes, the person who put the introduction to the volume and put it together, only the joy that comes after suffering can evoke the tears of happiness. And salvation from the midst of trouble is what brings forth the tears of joy. I will bring them in weeping and, and supplication. The supplications calls when you're in pain, but, and you feel that after, even if you escape a terrible, I think like the Holocaust survivors, anybody who's going through a trauma, the, the, the people who are victims of terror, it remains after, even if they escape, there is still the traces of that. And yet, it, and yet, as it says, the righteous, the end of the righteous is 
The beginning is suffering and the end is tranquility. With, with the evil, it's the opposite. They begin in tranquility and they end in suffering. The righteous begin with pain and they end in tranquility. The, I want to relate this again to Yom HaShoah and also to a little bit as a final word about our contemporary situation in Israel. I'm not talking politically, by the way. That's not my, but just the existential experience. I think in the whole world today, we're in this great situation of turmoil, as we see, and, and great suffering for so many people. There was a, um, an email list that I belong to through the Wexner Foundation, and every week they send across, you know, the Parsha of the Week. Actually, Rav Huttner was also very funny, and he once said, I don't know how these rabbis keep giving sermons, you know, they have to come up with something new every week. I, it take, I can only come up with a few new things every year. But, so, one came across from Rabbi Daniel Landis. Does anybody know who he is? He was a rabbi in Los Angeles, and he made Aliyah probably about five, seven years ago, and became the head of the Pardes School of Jewish Studies, which, by the way, lost two of its students in the Hebrew University bombing. Um, that school did as well. I think almost everybody, everybody has. And he wrote a commentary for one of the weeks on, in the Torah, and he, he added a personal note at the end. And it was amazing, because I intended to use this to conclude my talk. I didn't realize it was going to be Yom HaShoah, but it's very... It's very appropriate, and I think appropriate to Rabbi Akiva in jail and the background of what he's teaching and the greatness of going on and giving his teachings on. And Danny writes there uh, about the difficult weeks. This was written in 2002, which I think was the peak of the, I don't know, there's, we don't know what's going to happen, but a very, very difficult time. And he had gone with his young son to the funeral of one of the son's uh, schoolmates whose sister, Shira Nagari, had been 20, 22 had been killed in a, in a, a bombing at, um, that was in French Hill. And then he was going to a wedding. And I have to say, this is just the experience of Israel. This is the experience that is talked about in the beginning of this book, weeping and supplication and joy mixed together. And I have to tell you that I was writing this, planning to write this, and it was Sunday about a month ago. And that evening, and I came to this, this portion that I'm going to read for you, that evening, I was going to the wedding of my colleague's son, and it was 5 o'clock, and I turned on the radio, and on came the news of the Ashdod bombing. Unfortunately, people, several people were killed, but it didn't explode the chemicals that they intended to, which would have been a mass, uh, really cost a lot more. And I went from that news to the wedding. I just got up and got dressed and the, went to the wedding. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm writing about Wendy and him, and now I'm in the same situation. But this is the mixture of tears and joy and the weddings and the funerals all mixed up. So he talks about, Danny talks about, he, he was invited to a wedding and he got a call from his daughter, Hannah, who was in the army, that she had finally received permission to go, go to the wedding. So he raced off to the army base to get her and uh, picked her up and she got in the car in her dress uniform. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, I got the leave. And everybody was so happy to hear that I was going to a wedding because when they see someone in a dress uniform, they're afraid that they're going to a funeral. And she smiled and fell asleep with her M16. So they dress and they race home. And that's why we speak fast in Israel because I think you can tell by the pace of life there how we're always running and rushing from here to there. And it's kind of a manic depressive existence. You go from one extreme to the other of emotions. And they race off to the kibbutz. And they hear on the radio that there's a group of terrorists uh, loose in Beit Shemesh. If you know Beit Shemesh, it's right in the middle of the country. So there's all these roadblocks between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And the residents are ordered to stay in. And they get, go through the roadblocks, and they get to the wedding on time. Okay? This is very typical of life in Israel. And the word spreads that the terrorists were apprehended. I remember this also. I remember when it happened. So the dancing is even more intense at the wedding. Now, the, the, the end of what he writes here is the connection I want to make for Yom HaShoah, for Rabbi Akiva, for this moment uh, of him in jail teaching in the continuation. He says, at the end of this long night, we drove the David, who was the groom's father's aunt, back to her town, Mevaseret Zion, which is right outside Jerusalem. She's a short wisp of an elderly woman who walks with a limp. As I reached for her bag, I noticed her forearm. 
Now you can imagine what I'm going to say. Yes, she wouldn't let me carry her back to the car. I did convince her to sit in the front, and all his kids, his family fell asleep in the back. As we drove through the hills outside of Jerusalem, this woman from the Carpathian Mountains told me of her two years in Auschwitz. She said when she was at death's door, she asked God for two things, to have children and to live in the land of Israel. And this wonderful lady is a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. I asked her how she survived all the pain. And I have to say, in, in that year, I remember thinking to myself, I would really like to talk to Holocaust survivors because it really felt like you, you were just being, you just never, you were under that kind of siege. And I asked them, how did you do it? So he asked her, how did you survive all the pain? What was her answer? I'll say it in Hebrew first and then in English. She said, Yisurim lo hamila ha'achona. Suffering is not the last word. Suffering is not the, Yisurim, suffering can't be the last word. You may remember the famous story of Rabbi Akiva when he saw the destruction of the temple with the other four sages, and they're moaning and crying, and he laughs. And they say to him, why, why are you laughing? Why, why are you laughing? Look at the destruction of, of, of the temple. He says, if those prophecies of the destruction are fulfilled, surely the prophecies that there will then be joy and gladness and bride and groom in Jerusalem will also be fulfilled. And Rabbi Akiva was also the one, I think, who gave us that. And you see that in several other stories like that. I think that's one of the greatest things that that teaching can give us, which is that hope and that endurance to survive. And in the great honor of those Holocaust survivors who went through that and showed us that suffering is not the last word. And you have also in the packet I gave you, you can see you have the story of the death of Rabbi Akiva and how he taught even until the end. And you can compare it to the story of Socrates when you go home, I have that. It, I just want to end with a, I got an email last night from a colleague of mine in Jerusalem at the wedding that I went to a month ago, at the wedding was Deborah Applebaum, because I think the family is known in Seattle, whose husband and daughter were killed on the eve of their wedding in a bombing last September. Deborah was at the wedding I was at because her niece was getting married. And I watched her standing there smiling. And I, I was just overwhelmed at the strength and the courage and the fortitude that she, that she had. And I got the email last night that she had a grandchild, a grandson born, and the, the circumcision ceremony was Friday, and the child's name is David Avichai, David, my father, will live. And so I think just as Rabbi Akiva taught, and that woman taught, suffering is not the last word. And there was a story of a Holocaust survivor today in the, in the Seattle Times. Did you read that? E extraordinary. Those are our great teachers. Those are our greatest teachers of how to live and how to go on. I think all of us, Jewish, not Jewish, in, in the face of trauma and suffering, that it's not the last word. And these texts, as we learn them, give us life again. Well, thank you for your kind attention.